uh, democracy uh, is uh, experiencing, of course, a recession, um, which is also a product of the fact that democracy has failed to deliver in many aspects. And so, at least in Latin America, according to Latino Barometro, which is um, perhaps one of the most uh, popular opinion polls um, regionally, uh, support for democracy as a government, as a system of government, is at an all-time low. Uh, so that should concern us, and it should concern us because it's not just uh, the the fact that democracy is losing support uh, is is also garnered, or perhaps um, autocratic regimes take advantage of this to exploit the weaknesses of democracy and sell a narrative in which uh, these uh, regimes identify or or try to identify as a democracy, as some sort of democracy. Uh, and um, uh, this is a is of course um, that we believe there's points there's a pattern here that points to um, uh, an autocratic cooperation on the subject of um, what would be the opposite of democracy promotion, which is really the promotion of autocracy as a system of government. That when you get rid of all the um, the troubles and the nuances and the issues that the democracy that democracy poses and all the weaknesses that democracy has such as deliberation which can take forever <laughs> right uh, to deliver results then you have a system that um, emulates democratic regimes uh, with democratic institutions like congress and the executive branch and a judicial branch and elections um that are not um uh, that that emulate or simulate democratic processes, but is just uh, basically um, a ways to or a means to build a narrative that helps them uh, 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 promote authoritarianism as a viable way of uh, as a viable type of government. So in this particular case, what we've been doing is following remotely following the elections of, uh, of of Venezuela that are scheduled to happen. The presidential elections are scheduled to happen on July 28th. And we have focused uh, perhaps more than any other because, because of our nature of a regional civil society organization on the limits to voter registration abroad. Uh, in the in for this 2024 Venezuelan elections, and the and the way we do this is basically compare it to uh, what would happen in a what happens in a democratic regime, but not a democratic regime that necessarily has, um, for example, like Mexico. Mexico has a system in which they tend to do as much as they can to involve all the, the citizens that live abroad. Um, to vote in the process. So they institute voting by mail, voting by internet, uh, voting remotely, and they um, this education campaign for voters, for them to know where to vote. Um, and there's alternatives for people to vote, right? In some democratic contexts, this doesn't necessarily happen uh, for a, a, a lot of factors. One of them, the case that we bring into, into the paper to compare with the Venezuelan case, um, not because they're comparable, but because they, um, we try to uh, explain which uh, parts of the narrative are the ones that are pushed by the Venezuelan regime to try to make it seem like a democratic process, is that uh, in Argentina, for example, which is the case that we use, um, there's a lot of voids in the legislation, and there's a lot of uh, rights that are not necessarily guaranteed by the legislation, the electoral legislation. So in Argentina, for example, you can only vote in person, in embassies, and in, in diplomatic missions, uh, which is a traditional approach that a lot of other countries in Latin America also use. And what ends up happening is that, uh, and one of the things that we mentioned in the, in the paper, is that there is a lot of issues. There's a lot of issues to accommodate the amount of people that show up to vote on election day. To give you an example, uh, in the 2023 elections um, here in Argentina, 449,000 people were registered to vote. Um, and this means that um, uh, there was a, an additional 65,000 people, uh, registered voters compared to the 2021 election, which is a previous election. Um, and just to give you an idea, out of those 404, uh, 449,000 voters, registered voters, there's 115,000 registered voters in Spain. Um, and which, of course, uh, is is, is uh, perhaps um, 
I don't know, 40, almost 40% 40 of the of the vote of the registered voters that are as scheduled to vote in only six diplomatic missions. So basically, if you wanted to split them equally, which is not the case, because for example, Barcelona is the uh, the, the diplomatic missions, the, the mission that holds the most registered voters, um, you could not, you would need to serve 90, you need to be prepared to serve 19,000 voters. In the case of Barcelona, there's 47,000 uh, voters that, uh, that the embassy needs to accommodate and allow to vote. Um, so that represents a challenge for the election administration. The fact that the voting voting is optional abroad does not exempt the election authority or the election administration of guaranteeing that every single voter that's registered there to vote can vote. But of course, you have people who need to move from one city to the other or uh you know, there's there's several factors that you know that influence whether people are out to vote or not. Um, people who are displeased with the establishment, et cetera, just motivations to not go to vote. Uh, but the fact that a, a single polling station needs to serve forty seven thousand uh, voters in one day is just not not feasible at all. So. Uh, this happens under in a democratic context. So if we if you take that if you take that over to 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 Venezuela and you um, you need to multiply that issue by a lot at, at least by eight. There's more than a million Argentinians living abroad. In the case of Venezuela, there's uh, estimates that bring that number the, the people the people who have left Venezuela in the past five years up to 8.3 million people who have left the country. Officially, um, the uh, inter the regional interagency coordination platform for refugees and migrants of Venezuela. Uh, which is led by the UN High Commissioner for Refugees and the International Organization for Migration, it estimates 7.7 .7 million of Venezuelans who live abroad. Out of those 7.7 .7 million or 8.3 million, the, the difference is very big between the sources that you um, that you ask. Uh, out of that population, it is estimated that 5 million people were eligible voters. Um, and of course, uh, although the current law provides that the electoral registration is of a continuous nature, uh, which means that it's always open. The registration is not active, um, is not, excuse, excuse me, passive as it is in Argentina, which is to say it's automatic, but it's active, which means that the voter needs to um, express the, uh, the, um, the citizen, needs to express the will to become a voter. Uh, and that leaves a lot of room for making things difficult for people to register. You have to consider that these 5 million uh, potential voters that live abroad, uh, the majority of them uh, are, um, are of course, um, inclined to vote against the government. So most of these people have been barred basically from uh, being able to register. Uh, the Venezuelan election authority said March 18th as the day for the opening of the registration process in the consulate um, and uh, a cutoff date of April 16th. But um, many of the consulates did not open until April 2nd, all of which uh, still observed weekends and holidays. So uh, you have to subtract those days as well. So that resulted in a much shorter per period for thousands of or, or millions of voters. Uh, to be able to register. It was reported that uh, some of the offices were, which are managed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Venezuela did not promptly communicate to the population they serve that the registration update was open. And so uh, it also established arbitrary and additional requirements such as having um, your passport with you, which is not really uh, the document that is supposed to, um, you, you, you have to use your national ID document uh, to vote, whether it's expired or um, or it's still uh, whether it's expired or not, you should be able to use your 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 ID and, and the password was being required. Uh, it's very uh, perhaps not well known, but it's 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 a situation in which Venezuelans find themselves very usual, very it's a very common situation for Venezuelans to not be able to access ID docu their documentation. Uh, so uh, in order to get an ID, in order to get a passport, they have to pay a lot of money. Uh, in uh, a couple of years ago, a Venezuelan passport could cost up to $250. Uh, 
by the usual way, because you know, there's, there's usually backdoors through which people pay more money to to access their documentation. But um, it's one of the most expensive uh, documents out there uh, in the world, mm -hmm. uh, uh, documentation for a national uh, in the world. So it's very relevant to indicate that these citizens who are located in countries with which diplomatic ties, for example, have been severed, in particular, the United States and Canada, were around 37 thousand um, or, or 43,000 voters already are already duly registered. Uh, they won't be able to vote in the July 28th elections. Of a diaspora that is estimated at more than 8 million people, only 3.5 thousand Venezuelans were able to register or probably up their, they, their, their update their data in the last registration period, which lasted about a couple of weeks, perhaps. Um, so we're talking about 3,506 Venezuelan citizens who are able to register. Uh, there's uh, countries in which, for example, Colombia, there's a population of 2.8 million Venezuelans living there, out of which perhaps 1.9 million were potential voters. 273 voters were able to register and update their records. In Peru, there's 1.5 million people living there. Roughly 1 million potential voters, um, our estimate, uh, is uh, 66 people. Not 66,000, 66 people uh, were able to to register and update their records uh, during the period that was open for that purpose. In Ecuador, pretty much the same, the same figures, 470,000 70, people live in Ecuador. Uh, Venezuelans live in Ecuador, 387 were able to register. Uh, perhaps the, 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 the one, the country that least uh, Venezuelans what it, were able to register was uh, the Dominican Republic. 124,000 people who lived there, Venezuelans who lived there, only 18 people were able to register and update their records. So uh, it's a situation in which um, a lot of people from barred, were barred from being able to participate in the process. Uh, and it while the legislation actually, um, which is not the case of, of, of Argentina, of course, um, the legislation actually allows for people to be able to vote abroad in national elections. Uh, but um, although, you know, one of the conclusions that we reach is that although voting in democratic contexts can be challenging, uh, it cannot be stated that Venezuela and Argentina are similar cases of imperfect electoral systems um, that that for one factor or the other uh, prevents citizens from voting. Uh, it's um, because, and, and the reason we bring attention to this is because this is one of the points that the narratives that these autocratic regimes are pushing um, focus on. The fact that, for example, if you go to Cuba right now and you go to, a, um, there's, a, there's election observers who come over from the United States and they say that uh, political financing, for example, in, in Cuba is not an issue or that uh, indirect voting is the same as it is in the United States through the electoral college, and it's compared through the indirect uh, system uh, that they have in Cuba where they select uh, uh, delegates, municipal local delegates, where they appoint, uh, that, that eventually appoint another delegate and then another delegate, so it ends up being like a third degree election of the president. Um, it, is not, it is not the same. And I think that the reason why we do these um, these these studies and and eventually compare them is because um, that narrative does have a lot of uh, attraction, and in in fact, it used to be spread in international platforms with almost no counter narrative to it. Um, and of course, there was no counter narrative because it was considered to be a non-issue. It was considered to be something that had to be ignored um, because uh, these processes were happening in under an autocratic, autocratic or authoritarian regime. Um, and you know, we've we've faced a lot of resistance as well from civil society organizations, even because at some point, participating in the election or following the election or giving coverage to the election is misconstrued as providing it with legitimacy. Um, and also that's one of the things that we believe uh, is not the case because the reason why these elections need to be studied or need to be covered is because it is only with the information and the data that we gather from that, from that observation that we can up 
um, hold both elections, like Argentinian elections and Venezuelan elections, and compare them and say, no, they're not the same as the narrative um, interprets them to be. Uh, and so while in Argentina, for example, the registration is, is passive or automatic, in Venezuela, they, it's 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 active, which means that um, it requires citizens to express their will to become voters, and this provides opportunities to prevent from voting. Um, Argentina's EMB and the executive branch have taken steps to expand voting rights, um, even though voting by mail was um, annulled a couple of years ago, but it was at some point experimented with so that uh, more Argentinians abroad could vote. Uh, in the case of Venezuela, that's not the case. Argentina and reg Argentina uh, also registers any citizen with an address that's set abroad in their national ID. While for Venezuelans, it's very difficult to get access to all legal, and not just the legal, but the extra legal documents that the embassy usually requires, which varies across every country. Uh, so so the, these these restrictions, of course, are part of a broader strategy by the Venezuelan government to tilt the field in its favor. So by barring 5 million voters, it has effectively secured that the election will only be determined by the voters who are living in Venezuela. So that goes against, of course, the constitutional law that establishes that all Venezuelans abroad should be able to vote. Um, and it's very, we think that to promote an informed distinction between both circumstances uh, is essential to building counter narratives to these notions that are pushed by autocratic regimes, particularly Russia and China, uh, that seek to establish that a country is democratic is democratic merely because it holds elections. I just I don't want to um, uh, go into any other aspect of the election that we have covered um, extensively in our report that we published uh, a week ago. Um, or uh, a couple of weeks ago, that is uh, available online in our in our in our website, um, because it would require me to perhaps uh, uh, go past the fifteen minutes. Uh, but I think that that's really that's the objective. Why we bring these issues to the table is to uh, discuss um, uh, to be able to openly discuss these issues. I think it's important in order to. Um, build that counter narrative on all platforms that, you know, there's a distinction between those elections and the elections that are held under democratic context. Whatever the issues that democracy may have, no, yes, of course, no electoral system is perfect, uh, but it's not comparable to what is happening, to what happens in, in, in Venezuela and in Cuba, Nicaragua, for example. Um, so there's a discussion that needs to be had within election authorities in Latin America election observers, um, civil society organizations in which that is that is not allowed to be the case to for these elections to be compared to the elections that are held under democratic regimes. So I'll leave it at that. And um, and after all the rest of the presentations, we can uh, I can clarify any questions that you may have. I'll try to be straightforward in my message. Uh, <clears throat> I will try to be very brief. And, well, basically, my argument in, in this paper that I'm working is that um, electoral integrity is seriously weakened, seriously undermined when the rule of law is also uh, weakened. What I mean by this is that uh, what we are, what we are uh, witnessing in Mexico is that uh, the weakness of the rule of law is also affecting seriously the integrity of electoral processes in this country. And the weakening of the real of the rule of law in Mexico has started by undermining the checks and balances between the different powers of government. By this I mean that constitutional democracy in Mexico it has been seriously weakened. And by this, by this uh, weakening, uh, electoral principles that should guide electoral integrity in this country cannot be enforced. So in, in my country, that's my perspective. Of course, that would be, it would be very interesting to listen to Professor Irma because she's a very uh, uh, respectable uh, scholar here in Mexico. But from my point of view, 
from what I from from what I have seen in, in Mexico is that uh, the disruption of power equilibrium within the constitutional state within the Mexican constitutional state has uh, undermined the enforcement of uh, the principles of ele electoral integrity in this country. So. Uh, unfortunately, due to this disruption of constitutional democracy, what, I, what we are seeing in this country is an autocratic regression, a serious autocratic regression. Mexico, I could say, we, at, at least in the electoral process of, two, two, of 2021 and 2021, we could argue that Mexico was um, semi-authoritarian regime that uh, it had it, it enjoy a threshold of in electoral integrity. But in this last electoral process of 2024, uh, we have witnessed, we have seen uh, such big irregularities, such great ir irregularities in this process that we could actually say, from my perspective, that Mexico has joined the team of autocratic regimes of Latin America. So Mexico is approaching more Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba, and is getting further from countries like Costa Rica, Uruguay, and other countries in, in the region, which um, are example, or countries that hold relatively um, a good or democratic processes. So, um, well, irregularities, electoral irregularities in Mexico um, not only happen throughout the whole electoral process of 2024, but even before this process started or had started, um, I could say that um, this irregularity because since that day he has, he has started to use fiscal federalism in a in an strategic strategic way. So social programs and clientelism started to build. Uh, the transformation, but I would I would say the autocratic transformation of Mexico. So apart from clientelism, which was used by the pre regime uh, thirty years ago, now we also witness Mexico that um, a new phenomenon. Was the extensive news coverage of the narrative of Lopez, which Maduro in Venezuela? Of we can we can say that since that Morena started to build the trans the autocratic transformation of Mexico, and apart from that, we can say that another a new phenomena also that happened in Mexico in this last electoral process was the open intervention of organized crime uh, to decide the outcome of this electoral process. So, of course, we, Mexico ha, ha, has experienced from a long time ago the uh, ruthlessness of organized crime, but it has never, I, I, would, I could say that it had never been seen as in this process, how organized crime actually decided which nominees would win, not only at the local or at the state or subnational level, but I could say that even at the national level. So this was this irregularity is quite serious, and I could say that there, there in Mexico in this last process we experienced such great irregularities. Uh, before the, the the electoral process started, but during the the pre-campaign and campaign periods, 
in the on the election day and even in this process in this um quali qualification process of this of, of this electoral process we we are witnessing we are seeing um such disruption of electoral institutions that i could say that uh, mexico in the, uh, is <laughs> has uh, the level of its level of electoral integrity of electoral integrity has dropped dramatically so um well we, we are also seeing the open partiality of electoral institutions not only of the elect the federal electoral commission but also of the of the federal the electoral tribunal the national electoral tribunal and um yeah the media as well we are also watching the, the um, open clientelist allocation of of social programs to benefit the morena the morena coalition so yeah um yes i could say that um that this is my main message now the mexico uh, in this last electoral process of 20 24 has experienced a dramatic drop of its electoral integrity and that there were such many such great irregularities throughout the whole electoral process that i could say that this process could be easily annual but the problem with this annulment oh is that uh, the law requires that the results could be determinant uh, in the outcome of the election, which means that the difference between the first and the second place should be less than 5%. And in this case, in between Claudia, Schembaum, and Social Galvez, the difference was uh, almost 30% uh, uh, wide. So in this, so, well, the the democrat the perspectives or the future for mexico seems quite um i could say quite um black no i mean yes um i don't know it seems that mexico has entered officially into an autocratic era and it's going to take it's going to be very difficult for mexico to go back to uh, its former era of relative uh, electoral integrity. So thank you very much for listening to me, for listening to me, and well, I look forward to your questions at the end of the presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am happy to participate in this uh, seminar. Thanks to the organizers. Uh, this is, um, well, uh, I am a researcher uh, in Mexico, uh, but right now I'm working as a civil servant in the electoral tribunal since um, 21. So uh, what I'm going to present, we have been, Hector Arambula, a colleague, and I, um, we have been working about this, I mean, in very you know, general uh, terms, uh, the, uh, with the research objective is to analyze to what extent the electoral tribunal managed to punish the and discourage illegal uh, conducts um, electoral malpractices uh, in the last election that took place the 2nd of uh, June. Um, for just uh, as an introduction, but Felipe uh, already uh, mentioned uh, something about the electoral system in Mexico. We have two big uh, electoral authorities, uh, INE, which is a national electoral institution. This is the administrative uh, electoral body. Uh, it deals uh, with uh, the uh, only um, the uh, uh, more administrative things, organizing, you know, the polling stations, the uh, register, and whereas uh, the electoral tribunal has to do with judicial uh, um, topics. Uh, this is uh, um, what we are doing. The, the, the electoral tribunal is the judicial body responsible for ensuring the legality of elections. 
peaceful resolution of electoral conflicts, as well as uh, the, the electoral rights and defense and uh, political and electoral rights. And it's important to mention that this is the constitutional court of last resort, resort which means that uh, the, um, the electoral tribunal has the last word in uh, electoral conflicts. What the, um, the judges uh, uh, as part of the electoral tribunal uh, says in their sentences is the final decision. There is no other, you know, step or uh, body that can um, uh, um, look at the decisions. Okay, how electoral, um, how the electoral tribunal contributes to electoral integrity in two ways, and um you know, looking, you know, at uh, international standards, uh, it expands and maximizes political and electoral rights according to international uh, and global uh, norms and standards. And on the other hand, uh, it uh, punishes unlawful conduct, electoral malpractices of uh, very different um, uh, level and in nature. Um, okay, the last election took place the 2nd of June in, in Mexico. It was a huge election. Uh, we uh, had an election with 19,000 positions. Uh, uh, so it means, you know, the president of the republic, obviously, it was the, the most important position. Um, uh, in, in the election, but also the Congress, all the, the Congress. I, it, it means the Chamber of Senators, the Chamber of Deputies, but also at local level, nine governors or, you know, state uh, governors uh, and the 31 uh, federal states renew local Congress and most local positions. So it was a huge election, uh, uh, which obviously means that many people... Oh, hold on, hold on. Um, mm. Let me okay. Uh, what in in which step we are right now? As I mentioned, um, well, the the, the election was the second of June, and now uh, we are um, in June, July, and August is the resolution of appeals. So far, we have uh, received um, in in the electoral in the whole electoral process nine thousand appeals. Um, it means a lot, I mean, in, in a lot of work, but um, dealing exactly only with the election results, more or less 230. So it, it is not that bad. What happened in the election? As uh, you can see, the participation was 61%. And uh, we have uh, 232 appeals. Um, uh, the the PRD, the left wing party, is the one that has you know introduced more um, uh, complaints, uh, followed by the uh, party called uh, Movimiento Ciudadano and uh, the other two by the PAN. What happened is that uh, we have a huge margin of victory. I mean, the, uh, the Morena candidate called Claudia Sheinbaum won the election by 59% uh, of the votes, whereas the second you know, place was another candidate by, uh, supported by a, a coalition from the you know, like, um, center and center-right um, uh, parties, uh, and, and she uh, uh, almost achieve 27% uh, of the vote. So, I mean, the, the margin of victory was immense, so 30%. So it was really nothing nothing to do. Uh, with the Chamber of Deputies also, I mean, Morena, which is the ruling party, uh, won almost everything in the Senate is exactly the same at, at the local level. The governors, I put, you know, the, the, the map, um, uh, then 2018, where the president, the the the, uh, the president, the, the um, 
right now uh, AMLO, uh, Andres Manuel López Obrador uh, won, and now, you know, as you can see, well, Morena is um, again uh, winning the, won the election. Now, irregularities, I mean, in the appeals uh, that we have received. The first one and the most important one is the illegal interference of the uh, president, the undue presidential interference via, you know, uh, the morning press conferences that he has held uh, for five, almost six years. Uh, but also, you know, the publication of a book where the position candidate was harassed, the presidential interviews in mass media where he expressed support directly in favor of the official candidate, systematic and repeated intervention of the official governors and civil servants uh, throughout the country, and they intervene in the electoral process and they use uh, uh, public resources on your labor union interference, also in favor of the ruling party, misuse of public resources, uh, even uh, uh, public institutions you know, doing exactly the same. We also have, though, uh, in a very um, smaller scale, what we call the shoe polling stations. It means um, where the opposition didn't have no single vote. Okay, and we also have polling stations with more than 100% of participation. As you may imagine, this is, this is impossible. I mean, this is impossible. I mean, more people voting, you know, the, uh, those who are uh, registered. And um, in the special case of the illegal and systematic intervention of the president of the uh, republic, uh, we uh, obviously found, you know, undue use of public resources, personalized promotion, dissemination of government propaganda, violation of the principles of uh, um, uh, impartiality, and in terms of numbers, uh, um, remember that I mentioned that we are the final court, the final uh, step, the final electoral body to, to say the final word about the election. So uh, now the, with the numbers, we found in 20 uh, cases that uh, there was an illegal intervention uh, um, um, of the president. And in another 33 um, uh, occasions, uh, there is a, um, an, um, a research, you know, that they are, you know, hesitating in, in the case of the, uh, the proofs that were presented. Uh, but at the end, in 53 times, the electoral tribunal asked the president not to intervene. And he, well, ignore, <laughs> ignore the electoral uh, institutions, uh, ignore the, the 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 word and the sentence of the electoral tribunal. This is just the picture, and I I, I um try to recall a sentence where we mentioned that the president cannot do this. Um, this is another one, which is a propaganda. What happened is that the current, uh, the, the, our constitution, the current regulation prohibits the participation of civil servants in the electoral process. But it also says, especially in terms of the president, that he must, he has the responsibility to be impartial. So this, this, is, this is the law. And this is also what the electoral tribunal told him during the electoral process. Now, how can we explain why the president did that? Why the president did not comply to the law? Why the president could intervene without punishment? Well, I, I would like to mention some of the, you know, like, um, plausible reasons. The law enforcement, uh, as Felipe mentioned, is weak. The president, uh, the, the law says that when a civil servant intervenes illegally in the electoral process, the electoral tribunal has to ask his or her boss so that the boss can 
the the um, um, the fine the fine you know the 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 way that uh, he or she can be punished yeah but what happened with the president the president didn't have a boss so we cannot ask nobody you know to ask the president not to do that so we ask the president directly and the president just ignore electoral uh, institutions uh, the other uh, uh, probable reason is that he has spent five years um, in um, trying to, to uh, 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 in a process of weakness of the electoral institution. He has done many, many things, um, uh, starting with the budget but also with uh, the way in which the ruling party is, uh, uh, um, is part of the nomination process of the members of INE and tribunal. So if the ruling party is so powerful that the, 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 ele the, the, the electoral process, so that uh, the, the nomination process to, uh, to be part of the INE and tribunal cannot take place, well, the INE and tribunal they are weak. So we have right now very weak electoral institutions. There are also systematic attacks by a strong and popular president because we cannot deny that the president is very, very popular and um, and the people really trust uh, on his word. Weak opposition parties. Excuse me. Weak opposition parties. I'm I'm I just finishing social and political polarization, uh, co-opted or, or, or self-contained mass media, which is very important for, for us, mass media, uh, understood that in a, in, a, in a country where the ruling party and the president are so powerful, uh, criticizing uh, them uh, could you know, a cost on, on them. Fragile rule of law, also mentioned by Felipe, and weak culture of legality, and a very weak uh, civil society. Uh, obviously, this is against all, you know, global norms and, and all these. We are trying to find out whether, you know, the appeals that we have received, the 232 appeals, um, are um, have an impact on the uh, conditions for free and equal vote. Final comments. Uh, to what extent, trying to answer, to what extent the electoral tribunal managed to punish and discourage you know, electoral more practices in Mexico? Well, I could say so far with, with this very, very, very um, descriptive research in the very early stages, well, uh, I, I think that the electoral tribunal uh, has had a limited performance due to the legal design, but uh, with you know a long chain of uh, uh, in the electoral process. But also, and probably the most important thing is there are problems of enfor enforcement and contextual factors, serious irregularities. You know, uh, uh, and the appeals have a negative impact on electoral integrity. Yes, uh, there is a consensus that there were unequal conditions to compete due to the uh, populist president using legal and illegal resources and limited uh, freedom to vote. Um, and I think, you know, one of the problems is that we can we can have good, uh, strong electoral institutions, such as the electoral tribunal, where I, uh, I work for right now. But actors are very important. Political actors' commitment is important for electoral integrity, and I think this is something we can uh, discuss. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was a pleasure. Okay, thank you, Irma. And now we can continue with our comments to, to the papers. Uh, Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the invitation and, and, and for allowing me to, to read this, uh, these papers and hear these presentations. I think they're dealing with very important topics and, and, and with uh, very concerning cases in, in, in Latin America. So it's, uh, I just wanted to start by congratulating the, the authors 
uh, for tackling these these issues and uh, and these topics uh, in the papers. Uh, a little caveat: I'm gonna I, I'll, I'll I'll try to be a little bit of a of a devil's advocate in order to strong strength the the the, the arguments of the of the papers. I'll try to 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 push a little bit some of the of of, of the claims that that you introduce, just in order to 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 show you how to improve and 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 uh, strength your your uh, your claims. Uh, I'll I'll start like discussing the, the both, both papers in the, about Mexico because I think they are they they, they talk about like uh, similar issues and 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 then I'll I'll follow with with the paper on on Venezuela and 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 uh, the, the um, yeah the paper on Venezuela. So first in, in the case of 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 the paper of of Betancourt, I I think there is an an implicit argument that has to be. Uh, more explicit uh, in terms of like the, the the author claims that this there is a problem in general um, in terms of like regime change in Mexico. Uh, the, the paper claims that that there is not necessarily an autocratization process, but that Mexico is already an autocratic regime, and that uh, has to be. Clearly explained, and, and and so there has to be a, a clear um, definition of what accounts for a democracy and an authoritarian regime or an autocratic regime, in order to show the reader that there there is clearly a, a moment in which like the, the 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 country has moved from one stage to the other, and I think that's that's something that that is that the paper is missing and 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 I also missed during the presentation, uh, but. More importantly, uh, this process of autocratization that is happening in the case of Mexico, the author claims that is related to the connection between the erosion of checks and balances in terms of like this constitutional crisis, because the separation of powers is being threatened by you know this hegemonic actor that is Lopez Obrador and, and, and his party, and the effect that it has on electoral integrity, right? And so this connection is actually accounting for this. Uh, regime change uh, process. So, as with the case of of, of democracy and, and 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 authoritarianism, I think the paper requires a, a more clear uh, definition of these two conditions. Right, like first, it, it requires to provide a clear uh, concept of of electoral integrity and 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 you know like the uh, the 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 dimensions of, of, of the concept and, and, and how you can observe those dimensions in, in the case of Mexico and provide obviously a, a, a systematic account of, you know, like there is this this kind of like um, uh, of, of, of actions and, and, and problems going on. And, and therefore we can say that there is actually an erosion of electoral integrity. And in that sense, I think uh, the, the paper by, by Mendes and Arambula they provide information actually to, 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 to show how this process is, is, is actually on the, on the place, but it needs to be clearly um, uh, sustained. And the same has to be to be done in, in, in terms of like the, 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 the this potential independent variable that is uh, the, the, the erosion of the separation of powers. Uh, there are some like uh, anecdotal evidence, and there is some like mention to 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 the testimony of of, of some public officials. But I think it, it requires to uh, uh, to provide like some indicators that uh, can be also like measured, not necessarily just quantitatively, but also qualitatively, in terms of like uh, for for us to be able to agree with the author that there is actually. First, these 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 processes are going on, and then that they are connected, and and therefore, like the the hypothesis that the erosion of, of, of checks and balances are leading to, and uh, to an uh, uh, erosion of electoral integrity, and in general, these processes accounting for a process of regime change or autocratization in Mexico. Um, so I I will just like uh, try to encourage the the author in, in doing that process because. I think uh, if if that's uh, fulfilled, like we, we we can see here, like a very important uh, paper that is that is um, um, not not just like describing the case, but also like alerting other potential or, or 
yeah, other other cases in, in the region that could face potential or, or similar potential uh, problems. So this requires also like a discussion about like this definition or, or this distinction between like autocratization and just like early problems of of uh, of, of, a of a democracy that is not necessarily uh, strong enough or that is you know like a weak democracy, right? Like what's the difference between um uh, you know like problems of, of of the field of competition that could be uh, uh, uh that could be part of just like a, a a democracy that is struggling with exogenous threats or social threats that are not necessarily related to uh the, the, the institutional design of, of, of the regime in itself and i think in that sense uh, uh as, as i said before uh, the paper by mendes and arambula provide like an interesting perspective, because rather than just like showing that there is obviously a, 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 um, an, an, an hegemonic or yeah, an, an, an hegemonic tendency in the government, the paper by Mendes and Arambula also show that there are other conditions uh, in, in place that can be accounted for this erosion that are not necessarily related to the strategy of, of, of a powerful president trying to erode institutions, but also because society is in itself polarized, that the opposition is weak. So in that sense, it's not just that you have a very powerful actor, uh, you know, like manipulating institutions and manipulating uh, um, the laws in its favor, but also that there is no reaction, but also that there, that there are other, 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 other um, uh, conditions in place. And and I will I will like uh, both authors to. Have a uh, or, or I would like to hear a little bit more about this uh, this process of, of the weakening of electoral authorities because um, that kind of claim requires us to have like also a temporal perspective right like it it seems to me and and I'm being probably naive here but it seems to me that uh, the same rules and and, and institutional uh, problems that these uh, authorities had. Uh, you know, in order to face Lopez Obrador, were also in place with previous administrations. Probably the difference is that previous administrations didn't have this kind of tendency to accumulate power. But th these problems are not necessarily um, new problems. They are, you know, problems that 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 have been in place for for probably since the democratization uh, in, in in at the beginning of of, of, the, of this uh, uh, century. So in other words, right? Like in order to 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 have a clear uh, understanding of the of the problem uh, of, of for electoral integrity in Mexico, um, I think it's important for us to understand whether the, it is the case that you know these problems were there, and 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 what has changed is that now we have a, a political actor that is trying to use you know like the weakness of the system in order to increase its power, or that we have a political actor that is actually changing the rules, changing the, 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 the uh, or, or, or using like formal and informal institutions in order to, um, uh, to erode the possibilities and capacities of these, uh, of these electoral authorities to, uh, to sanction its, its behavior, right? Like for instance, one of the examples that the paper provides or sorry, the presentation provides uh, by the end, right? Like it's like so. Um, is it the case that the, that that Lopez Obrador changed the legislation in order to make these institutions unable to punish him, or that these institutions were unable to punish any other uh, on any other president, right? Like so, it's it's it could be the case that it's a combination of both things going on, right? Like it, it is a combination of you know like already existing problems plus a president that is actively you know, changing the rules or changing the authorities in order to co-opt them and, 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 and being able to um, uh, to to use these uh, these institutions in favor uh, or or just like limit the possibilities of uh, of these institutions to to um, to regulate his behavior. So I think that kind of 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 discussion is it could be important in both cases, right? Because so far, the, the 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 claims are very strong in terms of you know like there is a problem here, but it's not clear 
you know, it's, it's, it's not clear for me whether there is a process of autocratization or that we're just like facing uh, more clearly problems of a, of a weak democracy that was reliant more on the self-constraint of political actors rather on the strength of, of its institutions. Uh, I will I will I'll pass now to 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 discuss the, the the paper on Venezuela and 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 uh, uh, because I think it it also has like a very important um, it, it's it's dealing with a very important issue that it's very pressing also because we are we are seeing it you know as it develops um, and I think contrary to the case of Mexico, it's clear that the case of Venezuela is already like an authoritarian regime for years now, and it already has like multiple, multiple problems. So the, this paper actually um, kind of like puts the, or, or, or forces us to reflect on one of the strategies that the government is using in order to uh, prevent the opposition uh, uh, to, to, to force like a, a a democratic transition. So this is like a different stage in this kind of process, right? Like in, in the case of Mexico, we are seeing like a government that is trying to capture power and the possibilities of, you know, like electoral authorities and, 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 and civil society and the position to stop that process in the case of, of Venezuela is kind of like backwards, right? Like we're seeing like a, an opposition that is trying to democratize the political competition and a government that is obviously aiming to uh, stop that process, and 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 in order to do so, it's 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 using like these kind of like barriers uh, for voters, um, um, uh, for voters abroad, uh, in order to prevent like because it's clear in this case that uh, you know voters abroad after so many years of of of, uh, of the regime, like most voters abroad are part of the opposition, are very critical of the government, right? like. Uh, so in that sense, I, I I have a couple of of questions for for uh, for uh, Eduardo uh, that I hope can help him to clarify the argument and make it stronger. The first one is uh, about the com the comparison with with Argentina. I think it's very problematic for me in, in the sense that uh, Argentina, it's not necessarily a case in which you will see the same incentives uh, for the government to 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 have like an, an intervention of this this process right like as i said before in the case of venezuela it's clear for the regime and for everybody that uh, voters abroad are critical with the government so you you already have like an idea of how these people is going to vote so you have like an a strategic uh, you can have an a strategic uh, approach and and say okay, I'm not I'm not gonna allow them to vote because I know for a fact that they are gonna vote against me and and in favor of the opposition candidate. Whereas in the case of Argentina or any other case in 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 the region that I can imagine, uh, there is not such a connection between you know being abroad and having like a political um, preference. So I, in that sense, for me, it's obvious when when I was reading the the, the conclusions, I, I was I was. Struggling with with the fact that okay, it's it's clear for me that Argentina, the government in Argentina, doesn't have to rely on these kind of strategies, whereas the case of Venezuela does. So probably the comparison has to look for a closer case, right, like in which you have like a, 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 a huge like immigration process, like huge refugee crisis, and and then like also a, a, an authoritarian regime that is aiming to prevent these people uh, for for voting. The other question is kind of related to what I was uh, trying to uh, pose in the case of Mexico. We need to have like a, also like in order to assess whether this is strategic or not, we have to uh, we need a comparison between uh, you know periods of time, because so far the it, it wasn't clear for me whether you know like this kind of like design or implementation pro problems. Are are uh, are something that is new or that was observed in, in previous, you know, like uh, electoral processes. So, in order to to show me, for instance, that you know, like this is a, a clear strategy, you know, a clear tactic that the government is using, uh, I will I will have to see that you know, like these kind of problems haven't been an issue in previous elections, right? Uh, and I don't know if that's the case. 
probably you can provide that kind of information in order to show and strengthen the argument and say, you know, look, look, right? Like for many years, we have been developing this kind of, 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 um, uh, of processes. We, 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 and, and most people have been able to vote, you know, that these barriers are new uh, and therefore they are accounting for, you know, like a, a specific will, willingness of the, of the government uh, to use these barriers in order to, um, uh, to prevent this, this, uh, this constituency to express their preference. And more in a theoretical line, I think uh, there is a huge discussion of, of, you know, like these kind of barriers and its relation to disenfranchisement in, in the case of, of the US, for instance, right? Like there is a huge discussion about how the introduction of barriers in different states can account actually for, you know, strategies uh, for the from the political system, but also from specific political actors in order to prevent the specific populations to vote, right? Like in the case of the US is clearly related to racial and demographic like uh, conditions that are, that, uh, so there, there is there is a theoretical discussion on this connection between like introducing uh, formal or informal barriers um, and you know like uh, as part of a strategy that that I was missing in the discussion of this paper and I think that kind of comparative or theoretical look can help can can also like uh, improve uh, and make a stronger case for the importance of, of observing this uh, especially because uh, and this is probably the, the, the uh, the, the pessimist uh, part of, of the paper, these are things that are not going to change now, right? Like, but we can, we can, uh, we can make it, it, it could be easier for us to, um, to highlight how this, this uh, apparently like, uh, I don't know, like a trivial problem of, 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 of you know, like barriers of, of, of registration, for instance, are actually creating a huge problem for the, 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 the prospects of democratization in Venezuela and how, for instance, you know, like international uh, community has to be aware of this. I, I was reading a couple of, of, of news articles in the past two days about this issue. And I think that's also something that, 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 that could be important. And then and a paper like this could provide uh, information that, that can also like inform us in order to, you know, like for instance, campaign in favor of like changes uh, that can be important in the future. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there and try to be uh, brief uh, so we can have also like uh, an exchange and, and, and comments and, and questions from, from the audience. Thank you.